welcome everybody to today's presentation from the History of Pre-Law program here at KCU. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Thomas Mackey from the University of Louisville. Dr. Mackey uh, received his PhD from Rice University down in Texas. It's Rice, right? With a Y, Rice University, uh, where he, uh, his PhD is in constitutional legal history, late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, he's the author of several books, including uh, Red Lights Out, A Legal History of Prostitution, uh, Pornography on Trial, Pursuing Johns, New York City's Committee of 14. He is about to have out a documentary history of the Civil War with the University of Tennessee Press. First volume of that comes out November. 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 And uh, he's currently working on a manuscript called uh, Can't Be Called Stealing, a, a, a legal history of the Civil War. So without much further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Thomas Mackey. Thank you. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here, uh, especially in a latish afternoon like this. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and thanks, Dr. Coleman, for asking me. Uh, it's always nice to travel to places I haven't been, see some new faces. Uh, we like our own students, but fresh students are always nice, too. So uh, I want to keep that. So I want to thank uh, Kentucky Christian for the opportunity to be here this afternoon, and, of course, uh, Coleman. As some of you know, um, he likes to tell stories. Uh, I did serve as his major professor of now Dr. Coleman uh, for his Master of Arts work at the University of Louisville a number of years ago. Yes, guilty, it's my fault. I encouraged him to go on uh, to doctoral level work uh, in the revolutionary early national period. Uh, in the United States. Um, he completed his doctoral work at the Blue University in this state. Uh, the day, and it just so happened, turned out that they, about the day, uh, I think it was the day after he received his PhD, uh, I ran on to him and he excitedly rushed up to me and he said, Dr. Mackey, Dr. Mackey, uh, isn't education great? I said, oh, how? He said, two days ago I could not spell PhD and today I are one. <laughs> okay, well, maybe that's not quite right, but uh, I'm still happy to be here this afternoon, and it's always good to see my former students, such as uh, Dr. Coleman. Uh, I also have to admit, I'm always a little bit leery of being introduced as a university professor. Uh, it makes me recall what the poet and essayist W.H. Auden once said about such people. He said, quote, a professor is someone who talks in other people's sleep. Uh, that I understand as we meet here in the late afternoon, you've had a nice lunch, some of you are looking forward to dinner, uh, it may be a low energy and a low sugar time, so if you happen to drop off, I won't take it seriously, uh, and I'll try not to boom too loud or too long uh, as the times go on. So uh, mostly it's really good to be here this afternoon. During the fiery trial of the United States Civil War, Kentucky-born, Indiana-raised, Illinoisan, President of the United States Abraham Lincoln, often spoke with and to units of the Union Army as they passed through the nation's capital of Washington, D.C. On August 22, 1864, Lincoln spoke with a unit of his fellow Midwesterners, the 166th Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment, whose time of service had expired, and they were headed home. Speaking informally, Lincoln said to the troops that he supposed that they were returning to their friends and families. He continued, quote, for the service you have done in this great struggle in which we are engaged, Lincoln started, I present you sincere thanks for myself and for the country. Perhaps because the fall 1864 general elections loomed in the near future, and Lincoln was far from certain that he would win re-election. And perhaps because military affairs appeared once again stalled, Lincoln's mood caused him to reflect on the cause of the Union. He continued saying, quote, it is not merely for today, but for all time to come, that we should perpetuate for our children's children this great and free government which we have enjoyed all our lives. I beg you to remember this, not merely for my sake, but for yours. Then, in one of the few moments when Lincoln revealed more of the inner Lincoln 
as opposed to the outer, the public Lincoln, he stated, I happen temporarily to occupy this big white house. I am a living witness that any one of your children may look to come here as my father's child has. Lincoln then spoke about what was at stake in the conflict. It is, he pleaded to his sol soldier jury, in order that each of you may have through this free government, which we have enjoyed, an open field and a fair chance for your industry, enterprise, and intelligence, and that you may all have equal privileges in the race for life with all its desirable human aspirations. It is for this the struggle should be maintained, stated Lincoln, keeping his eye fixed on the big picture of the war, that we may not lose our birthright, not now, not later. He then summed up, quote, the nation is worth fighting for to secure such an inestimable jewel. This inestimable jewel constituted self-government under the 1787 Constitution with the older Whig version of economic success for the individual without artificial restraints, restricting one's rising in the culture and the economy and thus succeeding in the race for life. Lincoln's vision of free government, state, and national that allowed freedom for individuals, including by 1864 African Americans, maintained and sustained Lincoln throughout the Civil War and became part of the modern United States' vision and promise. Though the promise may have been delayed, the lasting constitutional additions of that era, the Civil War amendments, signify the changed constitutional and legal world after the war, and they remain significant <coughs> into the 21st century. Those Civil War, Reconstruction Era, constitutional amendments constitute the constitutional, quote, new birth of freedom that Lincoln had spoken about in November uh, 1863 at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. With hindsight, it is clear that the first section of the 1868 14th Amendment forms what scholars have called a second United States Constitution that continues to challenge and to inspire all citizens and their varied public policies, rights, and politics. The United States Civil War and Reconstruction constitutes the most important transform transformative era in the nation's history, the era that laid the roots for current modern United States. Without disparaging or undervaluing the importance of the era of the revolution and constitutional period in the United States history, that so worries Dr. Coleman, and the bravery and sacrifices of the revolutionary generation, it was the era of Abraham Lincoln and the Congresses of the 1860s and 70s that laid the foundation both for the rise of the United States as an industrial and world power and laid the foundations for a promise of a more perfect union of treatment of individuals and interest groups within the country. Scholars no longer argue that Reconstruction was a failure. In the words of constitutional historian Harold Hyman, Reconstruction was neither a vision of failure nor a failure of vision. Current scholars place African American participation in the, into the Reconstruction story and argue that it is not surprising that Reconstruction did not achieve all its goals. Rather, given the historical context, it's surprising how much got done during Reconstruction and how the effects of the reformers during Reconstruction presaged later values, movements, <coughs> and developments that have come to dominate the nation's agenda in different and later historical contexts. Thus, it would take an era of a second Reconstruction to start the process of fulfilling the constitutional values and promises of the age of Lincoln. In order to demonstrate the continuing significance and importance of the era of the Civil War Reconstruction for moderns here in the early 21st century, the Civil War Amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment, encapsulated the dynamic understanding of federalism of that era and a new relationship between the government generally and especially the federal central government in particular 
for individuals and groups. As argued by NYU law professor William Nelson about the 14th Amendment, but applying equally to the other Reconstruction Amendments, the immediate political needs of the amendments have come to be overshadowed by the judicial doctrines required to institutionalize the fundamental values embedded in those amendments. Thus, if Lincoln was right, and the United States was a nation worth fighting for to secure such an inestimable jewel, then the Civil War Reconstruction Amendments restated the nation's mission and vision and, start and stated a mission and vision still applicable to moderns. Their vision of the 1860s may not be the vision of political majorities of the early 21st century, but the continuity between both of those era, eras is a commitment to building a more equitable political order while retaining a self-constraining, limited constitutional government. On January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and changed the nature of the United States Civil War and potentially changed race relations within the United States. First, to the original war goal of maintaining what the founders had established, Lincoln's proclamation added a second war goal to the national cause, emancipation. In order to preserve the Union, and by 1863, remember, Northerners and Westerners more and more employed the singular term nation instead of the plural term union. The root problem had to be addressed, race relations organized along the lines of master and slave. Thus, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation constituted the second major war goal, the end of state-based institution of slavery. But as commentators then and scholars ever since have pointed out, the Emancipation Proclamation freed no one that day, even though it potentially freed everyone from slavery, blacks as well as whites, southerners <coughs> as well as northerners. What the proclamation did was to pledge the future nation, should you federal armies be successful in winning the war, of course, to a new nation without the incubus of slavery. In Lincoln's eyes and words, a new birth of freedom for all lay in the nation's future. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, even as tentative as it was, committed the nation to that future. And as important as the proclamation was at the time and since, it was still just a presidential proclamation based on Lincoln's war powers. What Lincoln and the Republican leadership all understood was that the proclamation was not the end of slavery. Only a constitutional amendment would in time achieve that goal. Surprisingly to moderns, in 1863 to 65, the idea of amending the Constitution shocked many people, maybe even most in the country. To that generation, amending the Constitution meant that they had to admit to themselves that the founders had not created a sacred document, an unchanging text. Rather, amending the Constitution acknowledged that the fundamental document of the nation, its fundamental law, was fundamentally flawed, and by implication that perhaps the founding fathers had been wrong, at least on this point. For that generation who believed that the founders were near demigods, amending their constitution uh, caused the Civil War generation to shift their understanding of the constitution from an unamendable sacred text to understanding the document as an amendable, responsive document to new values and new sensitivities of their generation. It was not until February 1865 before Congress adopted the language of what would become the 13th Amendment. Lincoln lived to see the proposed amendment passed out of Congress and go to the states for ratification, but he did not live to see the amendment ratified on December 6, 1865. Simple, perhaps even simplistic in its wording, the 13th Amendment reads, quote, Section 1. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, wherever the party shall be duly convicted. Boy, oh boy, those lawyers are everywhere. 
neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereas the party shall be duly punished, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Then, Congress added something new in, in the United States constitutional world, an enforcement clause, the nation's first. Section two, Congress shall have power to enforce this amendment with appropriate legislation. This plain language of an enforcement clause to, the, to a federal constitutional amendment signifies a new federal world, a new federalism, and a potentially revolutionary federalism after the war. With this key clause, Congress possessed the power, actually a constitutional mandate, to enforce the end of slavery with, quote, appropriate legislation. In effect, the enforcement clause constitutes a kind of blank check to Congress to act and react in the foreseeable future in order to deal with the cancer of slavery. And it was Congress, the national government, which set the standards for the treatment of individuals within states by their own states. And that relationship was something new in the constitutional relationship between the central government and the states. From that new constitutional baseline grew another question, the lawyer's slippery slope problem. <coughs> if slavery cannot exist, then what else can Congress do to enforce the 13th Amendment's end of slavery. The actions of Southerners and Southern states answered the question and spurred Congress to action under the 13th Amendment. With the end of the war in the spring of 1865, Southern states began to reconstitute themselves, or at least Southern state governments began to reconstitute themselves. Many of those state governments dropped slave codes from their state laws but replaced them with the infamous black codes. Those codes sought to reintroduce slavery upon the African American communities in everything but name. A device to maintain white majority community dominance within states and localities, the black codes also sought to enter the post-war years with as little change in Southern race relations as possible and in spite of the 13th Amendment. Freedom certainly did not mean the black codes. And in 1866, Congress struck back against the black codes by employing the 13th Amendment's enforcement clause. On April 9th, 1866, Congress enacted the first Civil Rights Act in the in United States history, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, in order to enforce the 13th Amendment's command to end slavery. This congressional action made clear that the end of slavery meant more than the mere end or the end of the institution of slavery. Rather, slavery's end <coughs> meant at least the fundamental economic rights of all persons within the United States. Section 1 reads, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, and I now quote, that all persons born in the United States and not subject to any power are hereby declared to be the C word citizens. citizens for the first time in federal legislation, citizens of the United States. And as such, citizens of every race and color, without regard to any previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude, shall have the same right in every state and territory in the United States to make and enforce contracts, to sue be parties and give evidence to inherit, purchase, lease, see, hold, and convey real and personal property, and the full and equal benefit of all laws and proceedings for the security of persons and property as is now enjoyed by white citizens. This section summed up the Republican Party vision for race relations in the com and the country going into the future. The first section states that African Americans were now citizens of the United States, and as such, the states cannot invade nor deny the rights of national citizens. Also, the fundamental rights that that generation believed were important were not the civil liberties that modern audiences think, and sometimes my students think, but economic rights, the right to contract, 
access to courts to protect their property, themselves and their families. And as the statute made clear, the standard for what in time would be called equal protection of the laws would be treatment, quote, as is enjoyed by white citizens and no other. This crucial statute, the Civil Rights Act of 66, should be read together with the 13th Amendment as constituting a powerful precedent in establishing national authority over the states. The Civil Rights Act of 66 established a federal floor of rights below which the states should not, could not treat national citizens. States might craft state ceilings of more rights than what the nation established, but national rights came first and established this baseline for the treatment of all citizens of the United States, even black citizens. While suggestive, this understanding of this image did not emerge in the 1860s and 70s, but did emerge in the United States for history during the second reconstruction of the 1950s and 60s. Regardless, at that time, the Civil Rights Act of 66 struck down and voided the state black codes. What would, become, what would come next was not known. After all, the states and the people who ratified the 13th Amendment and enacted the Civil Rights Act of 66 did not know that another amendment would, in time, be necessary. The problem for the Republican Party majorities in both the House of Congress, in both houses of Congress, was not that the Civil Rights Act of 66 was incorrect policy. In fact, in light of the 13th Amendment and the imperatives of the 13th Amendment, uh, it was correct public policy. The problem and fear was that at some point in the future, the Republicans hoped in the distant future, that the all-white Democrat Party would gain control of Congress and repeal the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Therefore, later in 1866, the House <coughs> Judiciary Committee went to work crafting a new constitutional amendment to make permanent the constitutional values and legal standards of treatment of the civil rights contained in the Civil Rights Act of 66. In time, a second United States Constitution, the 1868 14th Amendment. While the constitutional and legal potentials of the 13th Amendment have not been plumbed by policymakers nor the federal courts, the 13th Amendment suggests the power and reach of the national government to void state-defined property, as in slavery, while possessing what on its face is unchecked power to effect the end of slavery through the enforcement clause. It is this symbolic quality of the potential power and reach of the nation and federal government that still infuses the 13th Amendment. Thus, the 13th Amendment exists as a road not taken by legalists, by, by legislatures, le legislators, and jurists to assert national power over the states, but a road available to be taken should the situation and context arise. Instead of following the historical chronology on in the 14th Amendment, let me at this point shift to the other overshadowed Civil War constitutional amendment, the 15th, which I think will be useful before I shift back near the end of my talk this afternoon to the 14th. The 15th Amendment. A product of the turmoil of Reconstruction and a compromise measure between pragmatism and idealism within the Republican Party, the 1870-15th Amendment has had a bumpy history. In the general election of 1868, the Republicans maintained their majority, uh, their majorities in the House and the Senate, and their presidential candidate, ex-General Ulysses S. Grant, won a solid victory in the Electoral College. But the white-led South and Democrat Party scored important gains in Congress. The Southern popular <coughs> vote for Grant was surprisingly close. Black votes in the reconstructing southern states had made the difference for Grant in the popular vote. In light of these political results, Republican leaders decided that guaranteeing the enfranchisement of black male population would form a counterweight to the rising Democrat Party. So on one hand, Republicans wanted black votes for the pragmatic and political reason to maintain their, their own control over the central government and to continue Congress's Reconstruction policies. At the same time, 
at the insistence of the progressive wing of the Republicans, moderates in the Republican Party sought to protect black equal rights and voting in their states. Thus, the Republicans sought to constitutionalize a ban on state-sanctioned racial discrimination in voting. During the debates on the proposed 15th Amendment, congressmen and senators debated and de defeated suggestions to ban specific state practices that deny the votes to African Americans, such as literacy tests. Instead, Congress approved another succinct amendment like the 13th. In its final approved form, the 15th Amendment reads simply, quote, section one, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And like the 13th Amendment, the 15th Amendment also possessed an enforcement clause. Ratified by enough states in February 1870, the 15th Amendment became law on March 30, 1870. Historian of the 15th Amendment, William Gillette, has argued that Republicans at the time considered the 15th Amendment the successful capstone of Reconstruction. Indeed, even President Grant gushed in his message to Congress that year that the amendment, quote, completes the greatest civil change and constitutes the most important event that has occurred since the nation has come to life. I would have thought the revolution, but you know, Grant wants a little hyperbole. Most blacks at the time believed that Southern white majorities would not abridge this now constitutionalized oversight of the franchise, backed by the power of the federal government. Northern and Midwestern whites, white majorities, understood the 15th Amendment in a positive but different fashion. Since blacks in their localities in the South could vote and defend themselves as citizens at the polls, white Northerners and Midwesterners now need not pay any more attention to what at the time was called the Negro question, quote, in the South. Anti-slavery societies disbanded, having achieved for the African American community the end of slavery. Their citizenship in the 14th Amendment and by the 15th Amendment restraining the states from restricting blacks from voting. But, as is often the case in history, the unintended consequences of reform prove, in the long run, to be more important than the intended consequences of reform. The Republican vision of a biracial, two-party South coexisting in their localities and states with at least a minimum of equality before the law did not materialize. This vision, this unfinished revolution, would be denied in the 19th century and only begin to be achieved in the era of the Second Reconstruction. Problems with the 15th Amendment existed. Contrary to what popular culture today tells students, the 15th Amendment did not grant the vote to anyone. The tradition and custom in the United States is that voting is a local and state issue, not a federal issue. States and localities set the standards and requirements for voting. Since the Second Reconstruction, the federal government has established some more guidelines and regulation, but voting still remains overwhelmingly a local and state issue, as Americans discovered after the general election of 2000. <laughs> Thus, as the wording makes clear, the vote is not granted to anyone. Rather, the amendment speaks in the negative. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Thus, should states or the nation or localities try to prevent people from voting because of their color, race, or because of previous condition status of slaves, then the 15th Amendment might prevent that. But if the locality or election official decided to prevent people from voting because they could not pass a literacy exam, then the 15th Amendment would not prohibit that test for voting, since on its face, a literacy examination is not based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Given the historical context of the late 19th century, with northern and midwestern populations waning interest in the problems of the South generally, and the black population in particular, 
this retreat from Reconstruction by the federal government and the emergence of white dominated South and border states, it's not surprising that the states and localities resorted to such devices as literacy exams to limit and in time, to limit and in time eliminate black voting. And the federal courts approved of these developments. In cases such as United States against Reese in 1876, the United States Supreme Court held the use of literacy exams did not violate the 15th Amendment, and the Supreme Court held that poll taxes as well did not violate the 15th Amendment in Williams against Mississippi in 1898. For practical purposes, the 15th Amendment had all but disappeared. Not until the Civil Rights Act of 1957, 60, 64, but especially the Voting Rights Act of 1965, did Congress act to suspend the state and local literacy examinations and character examinations placed on by voting that kept blacks from voting and placed federal examiners in localities to register blacks to vote where they had previously been denied voting. In 1870, President Grant was correct in pointing out the dramatic transformation that the 15th Amendment represented and symbolized in its potential for altering the political and voter landscape of the United States. Grant's error was in believing that such dramatic changes would or could occur during his administration. Yet he was not entirely off the mark. The 15th Amendment does possess enormous potential for political change. Together with the 14th Amendment, the 1868 14th Amendment, the 15th has established the federal floor high for the treatment of citizens by their states and localities in access to the voting booth and access to political power. These political advancements in the treatment of citizens cannot be denied nor their importance diminished, and their origins lay in the vision and values in the era of Abraham Lincoln. Yet none of the Civil War Reconstruction Era constitutional amendments has had greater political influence, more of a transformative effect to the United States federal system, and worked as much of a revolution, I think exactly the word, in the fundamental constitutional structure than the 1868 14th Amendment. This second American constitution, the 14th Amendment constitutes <coughs> the constitutional basis for modern industrial and po now post-industrial United States. And it encapsulates and institutionalizes Lincoln's vision of a nation, not some vague union, his idea of a new birth of freedom. That amendment wrought a new balance in federalism and did so without extinguishing the states, nor mandated a consolidated, all-powerful, all-consuming central government. The 14th Amendment achieves this balance in language that is narrow <coughs> enough to be accessible to laypersons and in language broad enough for the lawyers and judges to adapt and adjust the constitutional rules and doctrines to the changing economic, political, cultural, and social context. Its language allows for both change and continuity, change with the historical context while maintaining, con while maintaining continuity with the fundamental values of its era and the fundamental values of the United States nation. Thus, it is not a stretch to say that when modern politicians and or the United States public speak about the virtues and some of the shortcomings of the Constitution, what they're really speaking about today is not the 1787 Constitution, but the 1868 14th Amendment, its legislative and judicial interpretations, and their concomitant ripple effects. It is the 14th Amendment that drives the legal and constitutional debates and arguments of the modern day, and the 14th Amendment that looms as the most significant of the three Civil War Reconstruction era constitutional amendments. This new constitutional order is summed up in two sentences. Congress structured the first sentence in a very straightforward manner and Congress constructed the second sentence in a compound fashion. Section one of the 14th Amendment reads, first sentence, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to their jurisdiction are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Second sentence, the compound one. 
no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of laws. With key ideas, values, and broad language such as citizens, privileges and immunities, life, liberty, and property, due process and equal protection of the laws. The debate started in Congress, in the federal and state courts, and among the general population about the meaning and purpose of this most key section of this key constitutional amendment. In all, the 14th Amendment contains this first section and three other substantive sections and section five, which is an enforcement clause that continued, tradition continued. At the time of its drafting and eventual ratification, it was sections two, three, and four that caused the most debate in Congress and in the ratifying conventions in the states. Section two dealt with the immediate issue of voting in the reconstructing state processes, while section three punished disloyalty during the war. Section four of the 14th Amendment states that any of the Southern debts from the war would not be repaid. All of these sections constitute reasonable actions to meet that generation's immediate political needs. Thus, in the short term, sections 2, 3, 4 of the 14th Amendment contain the political goals of Republican majorities in Congress and the Republican majorities in the country. But in the long run, section 1, with its broad, inspecific, suggestive language, has outlived the other sections of the 14th Amendment and has proven to be the most debated and most analyzed section of the 14th Amendment. Justices, judges, legislators, lawyers, law professors, political scientists, all imaginable variety of interest groups, and of course historians like Dr. Coleman and myself have built their own interpretations of section one. Starting with the five to four 1873 decision in its first judicial interpretation by the United States Supreme Court, in the slaughterhouse cases, section one has been interpreted and reinterpreted in order to fit the needs and speak to the concerns in a variety of historical contexts. An entire history, review of the entire history of section one is beyond the scope of my efforts this afternoon. But it's not too extreme to say that section one is a gloss, is a rewriting, is a guide, if you like, to the constitutional, legal, and even political history of the United States since 1868. Lumping key areas of the interpretive debates together in section one, three particular areas of contention and questioning have emerged over time. First, did the first section of the 14th Amendment protect voting rights of the newly enfranchised African Americans, thus shifting oversight for voting rights from its traditional location in the states to the federal government. Second, did section one make the states abide by the fundamental rights listed in the federal Bill of Rights as opposed to only the state's own Bill of Rights? And third, did the 14th Amendment's definition of citizenship, its statement on the primacy of federal citizenship over state citizenship, and its listing of the rights of national citizens that the states must not abridge prohibit state-sanctioned, race-based segregation. Although all these questions are important, even crucial ones in the history of the United States since the 14th Amendment's ratification, as William Nelson has argued, these questions, quote, can never be answered confidently, end quote. He continued, all that the person who inquires into the historical record in search of an answer can do is to make a guess, a guess that is more likely to reflect his or her political beliefs than to reflect the state of the historical record." End quote. Thus asking questions about whether the drafters and those who ratified the amendment originally might have thought about modern contentious issues such as abortion, gay marriage, offensive funeral protests, the incorporation of the Federal Bill of Rights, mandatory federal health insurance, or, racially, or racial segregation would be the wrong questions. Those questions are intriguing, but ultimately they come <coughs> the wrong questions 
because those questions do not address the short-term or long-term political and cultural values and goals that the majorities in Congress and the states debated during Reconstruction regarding the 14th Amendment. Nevertheless, the central place of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment shows no sign whatsoever of slipping from being the primary focus of the United States Supreme Court and thus constitutional interpretation. It continues to perform as the key language for constitutional interpretation of the ever-changing legal disputes brought to the federal and state courts. Through their judicial interpretation, the Supreme Court keeps the United States constitutional values in touch with current historical contexts and issues. While not perfect, and while a time lag exists between the perception of a social or economic problem and when that issue reaches the state and federal courts, Section 1 constitutes the driving force of this most important of the Civil War of constitutional amendments, the single most important part of the modern Second United States Constitution. On August 22, 1864, when President Lincoln spoke to the 166th Ohio Volunteer Infantry Regiment, he told them that, quote, the nation is worth fighting for to secure such an inestimable duty. In part, Lincoln spoke about the constitutional world he knew and worked within as president. But he was also speaking about what values his generation wanted to leave to future generations of American citizens. Self-government under law, but on a new basis, a new birth of freedom, of a constitutional order that balanced national strength without collapsing the states, of national citizenship and a new treatment of all persons by all levels of government in the federal system on a more egalitarian and equal manner. It is this complicated bundle of fundamental values that constitutes the revolutionary quality of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. While the historical record demonstrates that the potential and promise of the 14th became deferred and delayed, Lincoln's inestimable jewel came to be encapsulated in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and particularly in those two sentences of Section 1 of the 14th. And the debates and arguments continue. Meeting the challenge of the 14th Amendment's mandates about citizenship, privileges and immunities, life, liberty, property, due process, and equal protection constitute the inestimable jewel to be weighed, assessed, admired, analyzed, puzzled over, questioned, and preserved for this, our generation of Americans, and into the nation's future. Thank you very much. For the kind of I'm happy to take questions, and boy, if there aren't any questions, I'd be really surprised. All kinds of good stuff. Please, sir. Um, where the language changes from the Civil Rights Act of 1866, yeah. uh, the exclusion of the under no other power phrase, Yeah. Uh, if that had been included in the 14th Amendment, do you think that uh, what uh, illegal immigration would be lessened? Yeah, did you see the the the, 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 the the first the use of language, and then the the what if this had been changed? So that's not a historian's question. So I can duck that by <laughs> saying that it's hard enough to predict the past, not the what ifs. Now I'm also brave enough to know I want a piece of that action. <laughs> uh, the the language does change. The, as you saw, the first definition of citizenship is in the Civil Rights Act of 1866. By the time it gets uh, just a couple of years later in 1868, in the 14th Amendment, uh, all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and the state wherein there is a dual citizenship. So they've refined their thinking in that two years. Uh, would that older language have changed? Absolutely because that, that language wouldn't have been in a statute, it would have been part of the constitutional fabric. What the courts would have done with that is anybody's guess. Uh, but that kind of gets back to the, you know, did the 14th Amendment, uh, did they mean it to incorporate the Federal Bill of Rights against the states? Well, they kind of talked about it, and during the debates in Congress, that question came up. And if you read the debates in Congress and the congressional record, it's actually quite humorous. Uh, a senator will get up and say, does this mean the Federal Bill of Rights now applies against the states? And clearly somebody in the audience, uh, one of the representatives or senators would go, I don't know. And the senator goes, I don't either. Everybody okay with that? 
Sure, and they move on. <laughs> Whoa, wait a minute. Wait, this is going to be a major problem or issue. But what they want to do is get over that immediate political question. And I think that's why this language gets slippery. Why stuff is in some and not in others. Uh, they're making this up as they go along for the political moment. So as a historian, that's how I would come about, about how what that language would do. Now, it's up to us in our generation to use this language to decide whether or not the citizenship issues, the persons born or naturalized, are should be extended to the immigration issue. Uh, if they get here, they are still clearly, even if they wandered across the Rio Grande, they're illegal. So they may be illegal, sort of, but they're, well, they're not citizens, but they're clearly they're still persons. Uh, we got to recognize them as persons. We have a long history, a very unhappy history, of looking at people and deciding that they're not persons, uh, that they were something other than persons. Uh, is that where public policy should be? Maybe, but that's up to political majorities to decide. So that that's going to be the, the we can decide how to handle this uh, through elections and lobbying and all the rest of it. But I think that the Fourteenth Amendment doesn't really give us clear guidance. That's the strength, but also the absolute frustrating part of all that broad language. Do uh, aliens listen to me? Uh, <laughs> illegal immigrants or immigrants less than legal? Uh, are they do anything less than due process? Are we comfortable with that? I mean, here all of a sudden, his language of the 14th Amendment, uh, maybe, maybe because they are, gentleman then says, illegal, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, even de deportation of them, we still have to follow due process, even to get rid of them. The uh, United States is a funny place, too many lawyers for much of its history. You can do anything in this country as long as first you have a process and then do what? Follow the process. He's right. Okay? So first you build a process and then follow it. As long as you do that, what can you do? Anything. Anything. That's exactly right. So that's just part of the American tradition. So long-winded answer, but that's, I think, a fair answer to your, your good question. What else, folks? Well, getting back to that, sure. isn't Congress thinking about the bullseye, but then forgetting about off the off the target at all. They would never dream this would have been an issue because they're worrying about the bullseye. And the bullseye was knowing that the states and the southern states, if they didn't make it that language, would say, you know what? You may be a federal citizen, but guess what? You're not a citizen of this state. So you have to bring that, okay, now you got to bring it all in. It may seem like an infringement, but the bullseye is <laughs> there. Sure. It, the, the, off the target should be if it's off the target, it doesn't apply. Well, maybe. Um, but uh, if it's off the target, if I understand the question, that if it's not dealing just with citizens, then we've still got the deal. They may be... Stand up. Okay? Okay, he may have just wandered in from Canada, but he's certainly not a citizen, but he's still a person. Uh, that's not, it, it all says all persons born or naturalized are citizens of the United States and the state wherein they reside, dual citizenship. You are French Canadian, but his intention is he's here, we've got to deal with him. So do we deny equal protection, thank you, privileges and immunities, equal protection, due process, life, liberty, and, and property once they're here? And that's the hard part. What does that word liberty mean? Or change your right to be quiet. <laughs> we don't know. Is it going to change over time and within context? Absolutely. So that in 1920s, the French Canadians in New England and in the uh, northern states, uh, when they were found, what do you think? It's an immigrant problem, sorry. No, no. They're here <laughs> taking jobs. And they spoke French. So what do you do? You send them back, you beat them up, and then send them back. <laughs> That's the American tradition. All right, but by the 1980s, 1990s, we no longer, no longer, certainly don't beat them up, and we might send them back, but they have to have 
process. Due process. All right? That's not the same as citizenship, but at least we recognize them as persons with some process. Now, the question really is a pendulum swing. How far have we gone too far in recognizing or providing too much process? Or, and others would say, we haven't gone far enough. Uh, so that's a question for context and political majorities to decide. So, last I looked, there still, the courts are still open, and uh, aren't, isn't there elections scheduled? No elections scheduled? <laughs> Sorry? I wish. You wish? No elections? Oh, she wants no elections. Thank you, comrade. Um, uh, but the, uh, last I heard, that uh, elections are, are, are about to come about. So, um, and then political majorities will speak, and we'll see where that goes. So, but this is the debate. And underneath it is this 14th Amendment, which gets us back to the Civil War amendments uh, and, and, the, and, and sort of the, the language that they've been struggling with. I know I'm, not, I'm supposed no. to stand still. I keep wandering around. No, it's all right. I, I can't possibly stand still. I have a question. I have a list of student <coughs> Sure. Uh, can you explain the history of uh, privilege or immunities, just like Corfield versus uh, was it the, the case of Corfield case? Yeah. The, and uh, how that how the that made case. Uh, the, where where, where Brushrod uh, where Brushrod uh, Washington uh, lays out the privileges and immunities. Yeah. And uh, how they influence how they can also explain perhaps uh, provide an answer perhaps to the the question of what they meant by liberty. Well, um, within that context, mm -hmm. Corfield against Coriel. I can't remember the date right off. Twenty four. Yeah, like 1824 Roughly or something. Roughly, something like that. And um, he tries to deal with this in a Fifth Amendment case, really, dealing with due process. It would be Article 4. Well, in Article 4, that's right. And it, it, it I, mean, I can't do this off the top of my head, maybe I, as well as, I, as he wants me to. Uh, but he essentially says, why don't we get Coleman to do it for me here, right, real quick, so that I can then cross-examine him. <laughs> no, go ahead. You're doing fine. No, because <laughs> uh, I got the databank spinning here, going. Well, I haven't done this one in ages. Uh, the, the the privileges are a factor of residency. Is that where it goes? Well, it's not. It's it's uh, you know it's the idea of you know federalism on your feet. Yes. You know you have, you have the right to vote, right to own property. You know uh, several other privileges in in, in oh, community motion. movement. Yeah, and how and how they take this as a term of art and right. apply it to and reapply it in the Fourteenth Amendment. That's right, and it's a term of art. It is this idea that it's a term of, that was the term I couldn't come up with. Uh, that it, it's stuff that that is real. Uh, I mean, there's movable property, this stuff, but real property to attorneys is and to us too is land, real property to get get people's attention, start mucking around with land. But that's what what, what what's important and valued. Uh, and once then you have a, a general consensus on due process, privileges and immunities along these lines, then it becomes as this term of art, as he says. And everybody can kind of agree with it without actually interpreting or examining it with a lot of detail. The problem with the, the Civil War reconstruction and then later uses of the 14th Amendment is the different issues continue to rise. You can read all you want of the federal um, ratification in Congress and the states of the 14th Amendment. They don't say a word about gay marriage. Just doesn't come up. Not surprisingly in 1867-68. So then you hear very knowingly about all kinds of, particularly social issues, that say the 14th Amendment demands, and I kind of grab my wallet and run when I hear that, because it doesn't. It doesn't. We can interpret it, this is the flexibility issue, and apply it in a variety of ways. And we may be using terms of art, like privileges and immunities. Uh, these, this gray area that we, we both live with, some of us worry about, but most of us live very happily with, at least on a day in, day out basis. Maybe not so happily for some, but that's okay. So, what else, folks? Yes, I'm usually this hyper. <laughs> Please. What's, uh, I know Dr. Cohen's perspective, but what's your pers personal perspective on the flexibility of the Constitution, i.e. the living Constitution and the whole idea? Yeah. Um, the, let me get away from the podium. Uh, the, there, that I think that the, the historical reality is that we don't live 19th century lives. We certainly don't live 18th century lives. Uh, that, in fact, we do want some flexibility. And I think the only difference we really have is in degree of some. Uh, I think we need to hold on to fundamental values, such as a commitment to limited government. Uh, I think we need to hold on to the idea that rights matter. 
uh, and that some rights matter more than others. Uh, for example, uh, stability in property. Uh, property is the guardian of every other right, is the, the saying of the revolution. Uh, but some of that's been washed out. Well, okay, a fair bit of that's been washed out. Uh, beginning about 1900 into about 1920, that progressive era, uh, liberty begins to be defined in a new way. Instead of liberty from government, what we begin to get is liberty through government or with government. That we enlist liberty on the, and government on our side to bring about reform. Uh, that government then becomes something that gives us goodies. Uh, all kinds of goodies, eventually the entitlement stuff. That then leads to what the 18th century, and we both worry about, is <coughs> dependence. Uh, and that dependence instead of independence or self-sufficiency is something I think that uh, you do hear about. Uh, but I think this gets, look how rarefied this is. I think this is hard for Bubba and Skeeter to kind of get their head around. Uh, and I mean that in a nice way, but rather because most people live their lives just day in, day out, worrying about family and kids and gr uh, bills and all that, instead of the, the nature of quality of liberty. So I think we differ, but I don't think we differ as much as sometimes he wants to believe. <laughs> so that I want, I, we both want both stability and flexibility. Uh, how much and to what degree, that's probably where the, the debate is. That's okay, we're historians. We only get along if we're arguing. <laughs> Please. Um, you talked about, a lot about the, the change in federalism uh, yeah. precipitated by these amendments. Can it really still be called federalism in a, in a system where the, the central government has so much influence over the states and the states have little to none influence over the federal government? Today? Um, starting with uh, the, the removal of state elected Senate. State elected removal of state elected Senate. Yes, that that uh, I don't remember which seventeenth amendment. Uh, the amendment that uh, excludes oh, state oh. elections of of the U.S. Senate. Yeah, well, direct election of the U.S. Senate, where yes. that removes the states from the process. Yes. Uh, there's your progressive era again. Again, we're going to uh, we're going to reform government, at least allegedly, then use government to help us reform the culture or the economy in this sort of way. The answer is yes, but it's a different balance and a different kind of federalism. It's no that, that one of the big trends we've seen since certainly 1920 is a drift of power and authority away from the states and towards the nation, uh, towards a central, what, to what the 18th century folks would call a consolidated government. Uh, that's certainly the case. Have the states ceased to exist? No, but... What do the states do? <laughs> Sorry? Count votes. Well, if they do, run, run elections. I think that's important. One of your colleagues doesn't, but I do. <laughs> what else? Education. Yeah, education. K through 12, even states, state higher education of various kinds. Uh, I come from Red University. There's also a blue one, and then there's some others around and all that stuff. Okay, That's pretty important, it strikes me. What else? I'm gonna, I know where I'm going. Just keep, bear with me. Religion. Ah, oh, boy, let's hope not. <laughs> uh, but uh, where I'm going is police, fire, and what we really want from government mostly, roads and bridges. Roads and bridges, infrastructure is the nasty social science word. Okay? Uh, so the question becomes that the, it's not that the states aren't important and do stuff. Part of it is perception, and part of it is a change in understanding. We first look for public policy to be set where? Not in Frankfurt, but in Washington. And we think top down. There's been a complete shift uh, of thinking. Uh, but as federalism has changed in the past, my, and I think as historians we both agree that if federalism has shifted and changed in the past, guess what? That suggests it'll change again. It'll change again. Uh, fasten your seat belts, it's always bumpy. <laughs> So that, um, I don't think you can dismiss the states quite so soon. Now, do the states have a miserable record, particularly in the treatment of minority groups and individuals within states? Absolutely. I think that's why it terrifies so many people to think that the states may, in fact, uh, that if we try to devolve power back to the states, it's where all sorts of horrible things will, will, will come back or rise up again. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, that's for your generation to, to lead us into the future. Thanks.
Sorry? Thanks. Thanks? Him? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Maybe you can see uh, his reputation precedes it. <laughs> what else, folks? You've been very, uh, almost too polite here. Okay? Anyway, thank you very much. Good luck to you all. Hope this helps a little bit, eh? Let's give Dr. Mackey a round of applause.